our director, and have since then now run our entire recovery response to this incident. Uh, so it's um, I, my experience previously was mainly in the response side, and even on incident management teams, we would show up, uh, go into a jurisdiction, do what, take care of the incident, and turn it over. And I never was really involved in the recovery side. Um, and I have taken recovery classes and ha haven't had a lot of experience in that. Um, unfortunately, now that's my entire day job. Uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, earthquake recovery, um, and it will go on probably for the next four to five years. Um, we're, we're really in the throes of it. So anyway, we'll go through the slides. Eric, if you could. Um, so. In our county, the emergency services office is under the CEO's office in other counties. Sometimes it's under the sheriff's department, sometimes it's under the fire side. Um, ours, it's under the CEO's office. Um, so we're, we have, I have a manager and basically myself were uh, to run the entire department uh, for Napa County. Uh, we had an established EOC with supplies in the supervisor's uh, board chambers, so it was not a warm EOC as we call it. A warm EOC is a one that's set up ready to go, so um, we had to, we, in any event, we would have to set up our EOC. Um, it normally in our training takes about an hour at best. Um, in this event, our um, our EOC on the third floor of the uh, admin building, the Board of Supervisors Chamber, was completely destroyed. Uh, so we had to, um, about four o'clock in the morning, make a decision to set up an alternate EOC, and we set it up down at the Sheriff's Department. Um, we have, um, since I've been involved with the county, uh, done very good training and tr uh, regular drills, annual drills. Um, I've been able to use uh, UASI training money over the last four years to get our staff trained um, in advance, um, intermediate, um, intermediate incident command and then advanced incident command, plus we brought a lot of uh, training for logistics, finance section, and other parts of training for emergency response. So that was a real a uh, good uh, bedrock so that we had a lot of our staff trained in the basics. Uh, we have had great relationships in Napa County um, amongst ourselves plus with our other jurisdictions. We're a small county. We only have five jurisdictions including the county and we work together on a pretty regular basis. Um, and uh, fortunately 135,000 people in the entire county. So we're not very big. Uh, we're pretty rural county. So that I, we believe the relationship part really helped us um, in this incident and still uh, is helping us daily. Um, we've had a prior earthquake back in 2000 and then our most recent flood was in 2006. So we have had experience in that and we have had FEMA response um, on both those incidents. So we've had a lot of training with that. Um, we did do emergency declaration recently uh, for a fire um, out of Butts Canyon in Pope Valley. So we had that incident to rely on and uh, we evacuated over 300 homes in that incident. Um, so we've had experience in, in the proclamation process. Um, fortunately, uh, my boss, who's um, also our risk manager, um, had had a lot of our buildings in the county covered for earthquake insurance. Um, and that was, that's a, a real good piece. Um, not all the contents um, we've learned were completely covered, but in most cases they were. So the uh, Earthquake uh, insurance pieces was really a big one in this. Um, and then the county is very fiscally conservative, um, so we had very healthy reserves. So when we started from day one, minute one, starting spending money, uh, we weren't so worried about uh, where that money was gonna come from. Um, to date, we have not got one dime from FEMA, um, and we're six months plus into this. Um, we're hoping to see some soon. On the other side, the insurance companies, we've got over $3 million in insurance um, premiums on this thing. So that's helped our response. Uh, this was the, the incident, uh, 3.20 in the morning. Uh, we're, we look back at both our earthquakes in 2000 and, and this recent one in 2014, and thank God that it happened um, early morning uh, when nobody was at work. Uh, this one was on a Sunday morning. Uh, fortunately, um, most of our buildings were empty. Uh, we only had one death from this incident, uh, a citizen in Napa. Otherwise, if this would have happened during the day, during the work week, we would have had, uh, we're estimating hundreds, of, hundreds and thousands of injuries and possibly up to 30 to 40 deaths. 
Uh, so that was the magnitude. Uh, woke up. This woke me up in my bed north up in St. Helena. Um, this quake lasted for about 25 seconds. Um, it was a very vertical lift. I uh, was at the game three of the 1989 Loma Prieta, uh, the World Series game going into the stadium. Uh, that was more of a rolling lift uh, down in San Francisco. This thing was definitely very vertical by the time it got up to St. Helena. Next, Eric. The epicenter was located uh, south, southwest of Na the city of Napa, uh, down by the Napa Valley Marina. Um, and we've had mo on the West Napa Fault, and you can see the fault lines on the east and the, the west side of the city uh, going north all the way to Yountville. Uh, we had um, aftershocks. We had over 100 aftershocks in the 30 days following the earthquake. Um, in the first two days, we had aftershocks all the, from 3 to 4, 3.2, 3.8, and then they, they subsided. But we, had, we were still seeing damage uh, from, on roads and um, in structures two to three weeks after the initial quake. Uh, Eric, you can go past that. Um, these were some of the uh, Highway 121 in Caneros. This was some of the lift. Uh, it's completely split across the road. This was the historic Goodman Library. Um, the, actually, the whole tower um, is off center right now. That was a historic building that was actually retrofitted um, back in the last quake. And if you went down there now, pretty much all the blocks off the front of the building are down on the ground. The structure, uh, the, 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 the frame, the moment frame uh, survived and kept the building intact. Uh, we had uh, quite a few structure fires initially up in the mobile home parks north um, in the city of Napa. I drove past those coming on the way down. Napa City fire responded. Uh, they kept it to uh, six, a loss of only six mobile homes. Um, the captain who did the initial response said that he was basically writing off about 40 to 50 homes in the park when he drove in. Um, because the water mains had broken and they were driving through just flooded streets as they got into the Moa Home Park. Uh, these are some of the, we had another structure fire downtown. So what's left of the mobile homes. Next, Eric. So some of the uh, water main breaks in the city in Napa. Um, they had, I mean, they'd repair one and one would uh, pop up down the street. This went on for the first two weeks of the incident. Um, really caused some problems. And the problem was then we had to issue boil water orders uh, for the citizens because their, their lines were contaminated. Um, we had an initial medical surge uh, mainly from people when they um, got up from their beds uh, and to try to check on their family. There was a lot of broken glass. So we had a lot of uh, um, lacerations to the feet. Uh, from people, uh, the initial medical surge was about uh, five to six hundred people at the Queen of the Valley. Um, our, one of our interesting orders at the EOC early on, Emergency Operations Center, was uh, for a thousand suture kits uh, because they would run out of suture stuff at the hospital for that many people. So we had a, a medical triage set up outside of the Queen of the Valley, our, ho our hospital located downtown. Uh, they eventually treated about six hundred people that morning. We did do mutual aid uh, and brought in nine mutual aid ambulances. And by about nine in the morning, our medical surge had pretty much uh, subsided. So we were past the medical side on that. Um, this is somewhat cleaned up. Everything was on the floor of the Board of Supervisors uh, room where our EOC would have been. And this is our alternate uh, location. We were able to be set up by 6 a.m. Uh, great work with our IT people and our comm people. This was down at the Sheriff's Department by the airport. Um, relatively new building, so it was seismically um, safe and secure. I also had good backup generator um, and the infrastructure there, a lot of computers, uh, some phone lines. Um, so we were basically to get up and going by about six and then start working on our assessment and start working on our action plan for the incident. Uh, we had decent up-to-date call-out lists. That's always a challenge for any jurisdiction, you know, with the turnover of people. Um, how do you get a hold of everybody? And is the date up? To, is the list up to date? Uh, we focus on it on a, every six months, um, but it's not perfect. But our list were, were just had been recently updated. And the other thing we took away is assignments should be practical. Not everybody 
on our EOC uh, org chart, organization chart, actually was able to get to the EOC. Some were out of town. Uh, some were had uh, to deal with family issues and structure damage. Um, so when you assign people in an emergency operations center, you need to make the assignments practical that they can actually have the, can do the function and actually give them the support to succeed. Uh, this is another um, picture of that. We had, uh, we issued a declaration, emergency declaration by 10 in the morning. The Board of Supervisors had a special meeting and actually declared early, um, issued that declaration. Uh, we had board liaisons assigned. Um, it, it's always a challenge to control the political side. So we had liaisons that would, would were working between the Emergency Operations Center and our uh, five board of supervisors to keep them in the communications loop and then what we were doing and how to get them to actually get the declaration done and then how to deal with the media. Uh, we immediately had requests from visiting officials. Uh, of course, um, our OES director showed up early afternoon. And then next, the next day, our parade of pol uh, politicians from Pelosi to Tom Thompson was there early because he's our rep. Um, he was actually up in Lake County and drove down the morning of the incident. Um, but we had then a constant parade of all the politicals um, in California showing up. Donations were a little bit of a challenge because we didn't really have our handle on a donations management plan. And we, I was getting calls from Home Depot that they, were, they would give us materials and, and they'd open up their store. Um, well, early on in the incident, we really didn't have a good grasp of what the damages were and where we would need those materials. So we put those in the queue um, and didn't really utilize them the way that we should. So that's part of our after action plan. And jurisdictional roles, the way the emergency operations stuff is set up in California is the local jurisdictions go to the county and then the county is, goes to the state um, and we're the conduit for the request. So you, we use our local resources first and then when we exhaust those, we go to the, reach out to the state and then they bring them in. Um, so those, that worked fairly well early on in the incident. Um, Napa City was hit hardest. Um, they set up their emergency operations center. I talked to the fire chief on my way down the valley about quarter to four in the morning, and he had told me they'd activated and what their damages were, um, the fires they had going. And they had requested mutual aid for urban search and rescue teams and fire uh, mutual aid. Uh, we didn't really utilize, we didn't have many victims trapped because it was, like I said, 3.20 in the morning. Um, we had assign some USAR teams to go out and check some buildings, but we didn't really have that component. Um, I think during the day, uh, during the week, uh, would have been a different story. Um, so we didn't really utilize mutual aid for USAR stuff, urban search and rescue. So some of the issues are how is your staff going to be paid? Um, our auditor controller has everybody set up on automatic deposits. If you don't, then she can't guarantee that you're going to get your check. So that was a good thing. Um, importance of documentation. I come from the fire side, so we use the unit log, the 214, and every staff member, every roads worker, everybody early on documented everything. Um, and I'd say now, six months into it, we probably hit it about 95 to 98 percent on our documentation. Were we perfect? No. Um, some of our roads crews didn't get enough photo documentation um, in the field. So we're struggling with getting those projects approved with FEMA. But um, overall, we did a great job documenting what we did. Um, and that's all part of what they're going to audit, and they're auditing now on uh, reimbursement for our response. Managing for safety, um, downtown Napa was hit really hard. And, uh, and this was late August, or beginning a crush. Um, and the wine crush in this valley is a huge economic deal. Um, September is just that the crush is going crazy. So really an interesting conflict because the wine industry didn't want to let the word out that we were damaged and they didn't want people to stop coming. But at the same time, our downtown was basically in the yellow caution tape. So, and I'll show you a picture of some of the wineries. We, we got numbers early on the first week. We got, had about $80 million damages to some of the wineries, um, and which was a pretty major hit. But they at the same time didn't want to get the message out to tell people not to come. Two of our downtown hotels were completely closed. In the first two months, we lost over 30,000 room booking dates. 
That's a major economic impact. Um, 30,000 room booking nights in two months. That's not good. And those hotels are just back up in service now. Just a couple pictures of some of the damage. We have some um, older foundations, uh, older buildings um, that really took some hits. Go ahead, Eric. Um, this, this structure was considered minor damaged by FEMA and Cal OES. Um, fortunately, nobody was sleeping in that couch when that chimney came in. Um, one of the, the, the challenges for an, uh, an organization early on was that we had to do an initial damage estimate. So the IDE, as the state calls it. So that's letting them know how bad we were bleeding or how bad we got hurt. And so we were really, that's all, you know, situation uh, and status and what you're doing and getting good resources early on. Um, that's a struggle the first 24 hours, 48 hours. So we were trying to come up with a number because the state kept saying, what, well, how, how bad are you hurt? Um, and our number, of course, kept climbing. Um, we were getting up into the about $100 million, and we ran what we call a hazus. Um, it's a hazard analysis um, report. And our hazus analysis showed we, the quake at that time of day uh, would we'd be about $380 million in damage with the debris and everything else for the entire county and city. And um, looking back at that now, that's about where we are. We're about $400 million in damage for the county. You move then from your initial damage estimate to your preliminary damage estimate. Um, the public assistance side is not for the public. Um, this is government ease, right? Public assistance is uh, government infrastructure. And then the individual assistance um, is for the individuals. So we were told early on by Cal OES and FEMA, get your, your public assistance number. And for Napa and Solano County, that number was 52 million. So we were working hard to document those actual damages. And they said the, in, the, the individual assistance would follow, no problem, right? That's the help for the local citizens. That's not the case. Um, FEMA has changed the rules since Sandy and Katrina. Um, we did get to the public assistance number. Um, we spent the next 60 days fighting for individual assistance for our citizens. And I'm telling you, it was a dra knockdown, drag out fight. Um, we did get it. It took a lot of political pressure. Um, they were not going to give it. We only had 200 homes that were considered major damage. And although FEMA said, there's no number for you to meet, there was a number. They weren't telling us what it was. Roughly, we heard it was about 400, and we were halfway there. Um, so it was a challenge. Here's the other thing. One thing, backing up in this and looking at doing it again, and I hope to God I don't have to do it again, um, we would order more safety inspectors from the state early on. Um, people were calling in um, requesting you know, safety inspections of their homes or homes that were damaged. And all of a sudden, we were, had 1,000, 2,000 in the queue. So we ordered you know, 40 inspectors from the, because we maxed out ours, um, 60, 80. Next time, I would order 200 safety inspectors right out of the gate um, to get them here to try to do safety inspections on residences. We had finally, in, after three months, we inspected over 15,000 homes, um, and we were still getting people calling in two months into the incident um, reporting damage to their home. Um, one of the other challenges we had in Napa County was we have a large Hispanic population that is, is a lot of farm workers, um, and they live multiple um, people to a home. They weren't calling in their damage because they didn't want their homes red tagged, and they didn't want to be ev um, evicted from their homes with a red tag. So we noticed early on our GIS section was working it hard and we were, we were plotting all the damaged homes as we were getting them called in. And we noticed huge sections on the maps with no damage. With damage all around it, entire Hispanic neighborhood sections. So we, weren't, so we literally had to send um, Hispanic people, um, outreach people into those neighborhoods to reach out to them because they don't, you know, remember our Hispanic population is, when they see somebody walking down the street with a jacket with a, a label on the back, they're thinking it's INS. They don't, FEMA doesn't mean anything to them, right? So they're not answering their doors. 
So it took us weeks to resolve that part of the individual assistance part. Um, we finally got it. That brought in a lot of money, um, small business, uh, uh, SBA loans, low interest loans for people and businesses. That was a huge piece, so we fought hard. And then working with FEMA and Cal OES, my biggest takeaway from this is that they didn't bring a good process. They're supposed to be the experts. Um, a lot of people that were assigned to our incident, it was their first disaster. I mean first had not done a fire flood or anything, but they didn't bring a good process about what, what, how the IA and PDA, or IDE, the in, in, initial damage assessment and the preliminary damage assessment, how that goes. And then now on the recovery side, all the um, part, all documenting of all our damages um, and that whole process. So that's my, in our, in our after action with the state and FEMA, that's what I pointed out is that they need to get better at Next. A um, lot of foundation damages um, in some of the older sections of town. Next, Eric. One of the wineries. Um, communication. I know you guys are all calm guys. Um, on any incident after action, is a, and we always number one issue was communications, right? On my after action report, uh, number one, it, communication stays at the top, then I fill in two, three, four, and five. Fortunately, we didn't have too many, we really didn't have a significant impact on any of our radio communications. <clears throat> and so police and fire and all of us could talk fairly, fairly well. We did have some um, issues early in the morning. We were told that the uh, generator for um, AT&T's facility um, that was basically backing up the 911 system. Generator was out of service, and um, and if we didn't get it up, they only had battery for about two hours. Um, Napa City's their piece up. They they were running, but they had problems logging people in. Their internet went down, and they were down for about two hours. What? How did that impact them when they're? off-duty dispatchers came down and started logging calls, they could only do it manually. They couldn't even log in to do it on the computer. So, um, so the incident commander was down in the parking lot running the incident, getting written hand sheets of what the, the incidents were, and two hours into it, they walked down with a stack this big of the low priority ones, because he, and he at that point thought he had a pretty good handle of what was going on, but he didn't. Um, so calm stuff. Uh, we lost our generator on top of our uh, main building, our Hall of Justice, our jail was uh, damaged and red tagged. The generator was off its, um, its um, moorings, um, its, its bracket, literally running up against the gas line. If we would have lost that backup generator, we would have lost our 911 um, and calm, main comm for the county. Uh, so they were able to get that fixed and up and ru um, running pretty quickly. Uh, but co communications went very well between us, Napa City, and all the responding agencies and the agencies coming in on mutual aid. <clears throat> communications between the department heads went well. Staff, um, we were able to notify our staff um, about the damage to our facilities and um, to not show up to work on Monday. Um, today, as of today, we have over 500 employees not in their normal workstations out of our 1,400 employees. Um, fortunately, the county had purchased this facility um, and we had planned to move our health and human services down here next year. So these buildings were empty. So we were able to move um, almost our entire staff. Early priority for the county was con uh, continuity of government. Um, and uh, it was the number one priority on our action plan. Uh, and we moved really quickly and were able to do that. The employees were only off work one day, most county employees, um, and they immediately uh, were able to relocate a lot down here. The two post offices in town on that, that side were completely damaged. Thanks. Um, completely damaged. And actually, uh, the one downtown is still, the historic one, still red tagged. Um, the post office actually leased building number four next door and moved their, their facility and delivered mail out of that for almost four months. Um, so these facilities really came into play. Uh, public information was a huge thing. Um, we had a little issue 
Um, with Napa City not wanting to do a joint information center early on, uh, we were able to resolve that. Getting the messaging out to the public is huge and getting the consistent message. So that was a, a big part of it. We finally got the joint information center up and running. And then working with the other jurisdictions, uh, good communications, good uh, daily updates. Next. Um, there's actually the, this is the most, still the most active fault in California right now and the state geologic guys are out there mapping it and the, 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 the actually the fissure line, the fault is still moving today, um, six months into it. Just little things like that, you know. Uh, main water line uh, from Millican uh, Reservoir uh, was damaged. Next. Um, getting back to work, like I said, was a big thing for us, inspecting the facilities. Um, our public works guys did a great job with that and got it going. Um, getting red tags and things tagged correctly. Um, we had some issues with that where somebody would go in and red tag something and the next guy would come through and yellow tag it. Uh, we resolved that problem. Alternate locations, like I say, short term, medium term and long term, we, we still have employees in the next building across the street. Uh, it st should be there for another two to three months. Um, we've got dueling experts on structural integrity um, of our buildings right now. Our jail uh, is still red tagged. Uh, part the, we have an old jail and a new jail, and they're, they're side by side. I'll show you some pictures. But we've got the insurance company's en structural engineer saying the buildings should be green tagged. We can move into it. Our structural engineer saying it's red tagged and it has structural, it's compromised. Um, and then now we've had to hire a third party structural engineer to mediate the thing. And you know what he said yesterday? They're both wrong. So I don't know where we're going. We have to date 66 inmates that are being housed and slept in Solano County and transported back to, and forth to our county because they have to be here during the day by state law. Um, there are prisoners by the state allocation stuff, and um, they're ours, and they, so uh, one of the things was we had to go out and buy a bunch of shackles, because um, we never were used to transporting that many. Um, this is some of the build, building damage you can see over the headers of some of our older buildings. Uh, this is one of our facilities downtown, the Carruthers Building. So it's the IT building. Uh, fortunately, they didn't have that much damage, but you can see we lost some uh, T-bar ceiling. So the jail, like I said, um, I got a call. Jail has its issues. I got a call about 9 o'clock in the EOC, and they said, um, we, the, we've really got some problems. You've got to get a structural engineer down here, and we did. And about an hour later, they said, uh, you've got to evacuate the building. And I said, okay. Okay. Um, do your evacuation plan. And they said, we don't have one. Because they mainly house those people in place. So we ended up um, relocating them temporarily in Solano County and Sonoma County. Um, but one of the state requirements is that they're housed in a contiguous county. Alameda offered to, they had plenty of room down in their jail. It's not a contiguous county. So we eventually did a deal with Solano County, and that's where they are. Um, inmate visitation is a requirement. Their attorneys and their family have to be able to visit them. So now they're in Solano County. That's a bit of a problem, right? So we have, we had, we have to set up, we set up video visitation. So there's a trailer outside our old jail that people then can go in, and then they have video right, um, conferencing to their, to their um, inmates. Programming needs for the inmates was a challenge. Um, and then the media, managing the media on the jail uh, was interesting. And we've done a fairly good job on that. Um, but the, we're still, the jail's still red tagged. Uh, we're still working on the structural issues with the jail and we have nothing. This is the expansion joint between the old jail and the new jail. Literally it's separated about four inches in spots. Um, this is some of that that wall. 
Finances, thank God, we were, were uh, very financially stable. Um, county procurement, you got to make sure your emergency procurement uh, stuff is up to, up to date. Because from the moment the earthquake hits, you, you, you're spending money. And you better be spending it right. So you have to have your, your procurement procedures have to address an emergency and how you're going to do that and how long that's going to be in place um, until you get back to regular going out to bid type procedures. Because now we're past the emergency part of it and everything we have to go out and, and do normal bid notification and, and do that. So you've got to make sure that. And our piece was good. Um, our, our purchasing people were, were on top of it. Hiring consultants, uh, making sure that, that they're uh, publicly bid um, in, in some type of a, a, a bid a group that you can go out and get them in. We had to get structural engineers, uh, architecture engineers um, um, in right away and make sure that's up. The insurance, like I say, was a big piece, still a big piece for us. And, uh, and then having your pledged assets with credit rating. Some of our buildings, you know, if they if they're have loans against them, we can't offer them up as, as security for loans. So that was another piece we had to work on. So lessons learned. Some of the, the best response, and I'll always give kudos, uh, was to PG&E. Um, they nailed this thing. We had over 40,000 people without power and gas, and they had them back up and running in less than 40 hours. Um, they came in and set up two base camps. Um, it was an amazing response, um, really amazing. They actually have a vehicle now that can drive through the neighborhoods and sniff gas and locate gas leaks. Uh, and they were going through neighborhoods in Browns Valley on the west side where most of our damage was. And a week afterwards, and locating gas leaks um, was pretty amazing. They're, they're replacing their entire system on the west side of town. Um, our local assistance center was another... Um, really uh, huge success in this. Um, trying to get information and help to your citizens is big, and like I said, we were fighting for individual assistance, but um, we were able to get the local assistance center up and be able to get them help um, from our, from even we had the DMV locate down there, uh, give them services, because the DMV building was um, actually closed for renovation and DMV was located in other counties, so we brought them in. The state helped with that. Um, we were able to get local assistance. The Mennonites showed up. Church groups were there. Um, our public, um, public health uh, people really stepped up and did this. And then um, also we relocated our county assessor and our building permits. Um, the city waived all their permit fees uh, for any uh, earthquake-related permits. Um, and we actually literally set up a whole permit center in our local assistance center. So it was more of a one-stop shop for citizens to go get help. Huge deal. Um, employee assistance, um, like I say, our financial our emergency purchasing policy was a plus, um, and that was a, a home run on that. Employee assistance, uh, a lot of our employees had issues at home and couldn't report to work right away, so we were able to get them help, um, be able to cover them um, uh, financially while they were out of work. Um, and then, like I say, managing the message. Uh, the social media thing is huge. Um, so our, our public information officers, we had 10 of them on a total team, did really well. So over where we are is, it's six months into it, um, I'm dealing with FEMA on $100 million worth of damage to county facilities, bridges, culverts, roads, buildings, our historic courthouse, uh, which is a signature piece of uh, structure for Napa County, um, probably has 15, 16 million dollars damage. We're still trying to shore that building up so it doesn't fall down, um, so we can then get it rebuilt. Um, that project will be going for three to four years. Our jail, we don't know where we are in our jail. We, once we get those structural engineers to make a decision, we'll be able to move forward. Um, those inmates are gonna be gone for quite a while. It's costing $200,000 a month to house those inmates in Solano County. Uh, so we wanna resolve that piece. Um, we're, we're a resilient county. We've done really well on this. Um, we need to just, you know, continue that the focus on our recovery side and help our citizens. They did get a lot of assistance from the from FEMA and SBA, which was good. Um, but fighting for that individual assistance piece was a, a big thing for us. Um, so anyway, 
Um, I think, unfortunately, I'm going to be dealing with this for the next few years, um, and hopefully we can get our, the rest of our infrastructure back up and going um, and get back. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it seems that you have a lot of problems with them. Uh, have you set up a testing schedule like they check their run weekly or uh, twice a month? And this is related to the Well, you were talking about the generator problem. The generator. I mean, getting a tech out to right. fix a generator during an earthquake is, you know, so the question is about getting our generators serviced regularly and looked at and getting them in an incident, getting somebody to respond to repair them. Yeah, we are, that was a challenge because everybody had that, was up against that. Uh, we had um, local, we have our generators serviced every month and checked um, on a, the regular maintenance, but uh, um, basically our public works guys and our facilities guys kept those generators up and running. Um, they literally, and then hired hired a local contractor, a heating and air guy, to come out and actually fabricate and get some um, uh, angle iron and, and you know, feet to be able to hold these things down and keep them running. So it was a challenge, but we were able to get through it. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. What's unique about the, the uh, mobile home parks that they talked What was unique about it? I mean, why the mobile, the mobile parks? The problem with the mobile homes is the gas and electrical all seem to come into one closet to service the, the mobile home. And so in the earthquake on those, they, a lot of those foundations hadn't been strapped down um, and upgraded uh, adequately. So when the mobile home shifted, it, it snapped the gas line, broke the gas line, and there's electrical right in the same closet. So that was the problem there. Um, so, and, and they have a whole different inspection, a, a state agency that deals with their inspections on mobile homes. Um, because it was just, it, most of the time you'll get coverage by fire. It was like two of our buildings were, we had a lot of damage because water lines broke, sprinkler lines broke. The insurance company, even though we had insurance coverage on them, um, the insurance company determined that was property damage and so we're getting all that, all that damage covered under the property, the content side, and our deductible is only $10,000 on that versus half a million for the insurance side. So, yeah, most insurance companies look at it. The earthquake hit, but then what, was it, what caused the damage? The fire then destroyed your home, and they'll cover it under that. Thank you. Yes. Is there a CERT program? Yes. So the question is, was there a CERT program and a citizen emergency response program? Yeah, we have a pretty robust uh, citizen emergency response program, over 1,000 people trained. And of course, post-disaster, we had a lot of interest in CERT classes, and we've, we've been doing them about every two months right now, and they're all, the classes are all filled up. Um, initially, they, the, the way we're set up with CERT in the county is they're supposed to take care of their, their individual homes, then their neighborhoods, and then they report to the Emergency Volunteer Center, which we did set up, and then they get reassigned for that. So we had probably about 30 of them uh, come down to the emergency volunteer center, sign in after their neighborhoods were, they were deemed somewhat safe or safe, and then they were reassigned. And our initial stuff was supporting the shelter we set up and then actually going into neighborhoods and um, knocking on doors trying to help with damages and, and that. So they, we literally, in those neighborhoods where we weren't getting documented damages, we sent them in to talk to people and their little green hard hats and their green vests are a little more warming than a uh, a federal looking, um, you know, overcoat. So they did really well. Um, and having them uh, assigned and, you know, some to the emergency volunteer center to get assigned into the incident, that way they're also covered under the disaster service worker um, coverage. Anybody else?